Hello everyone, my name is Dr. John Gross and welcome back to another GIS lecture video. In this lecture video, what I want to do is I want to continue our discussion on the basics of cartography by talking about the building blocks of a map or the parts of a map. Traditionally, you'll hear people refer to these things as the elements of a map or the map elements. And there are several and we're not going to go through every single one of them. But what I want to do is I want to hit on most of them so that you get a solid feel for the things that are going to pop up time and time again as you make maps and as you see other people's maps and give you an idea of what each piece is, when it's useful, and some, maybe in some cases some alternative ways to, to achieve the same goal. Um, so I'm going to zoom out here a little bit. So this is a reference map, and the reason we know that it's a reference map is because you can see that it has a lot of different layers involved, but yet none of them dominate, and we're not looking at the distribution or the pattern of any particular one. So what I want to do with this map is just break down the different pieces that are involved and talk about the different concepts. So. The first thing I want to talk about is going to be what's called the main element. So we're, do, we're talking about map elements. Right, number one is going to be the main element. Right now, the main element on this map is going to be this outline right here. So the main element is something that every map has to have. I'm going to put a star here because this is the, I'm putting a star here because your main element is the star of the show. It is the thing that the map is meant made about. It's the thing that the map is made for, right? This is going to be the core data. Right, this is going to be all of the data layers that you want to make sure that the user sees and the user understands. Right, In the case of a reference map, this is going to be all of the layers that are giving you the information about the area. In the case of a thematic map, right, it's the data that is being visualized to highlight the pattern. Right, That's your main element. It should be the focus of the map. It should be, generally speaking, it should be the largest thing on the map. All right, so that's this piece here. The next thing that you're often going to see, I'm gonna do it in red here, I'm gonna try and color code these things. All right, two is going to be orientation. T-A-T-I-O-N, orientation. Right. So with orientation, what orientation does is it tells the user how to make the map point north. Right. It gives the user the sense of what direction is north. Right. It orients the map in the right direction. Now, a common misconception with north arrows is that you always need them. Um, so I'm gonna kind of make a note here, right? You do not always need a north arrow, right? Generally speaking, people include them. And basically, when, when do you need a north arrow? You need a north arrow whenever the orientation is unclear so this could be if you rotated the data right say for example you're building a map and you have a really solid layout that you want to use but the main element doesn't fit in a rot in an orientation that would be having north point up, if you rotate the data, you definitely need to have a north arrow to indicate that you've done that. Um, if you have an area that is unfamiliar to the user, right, 
right? Generally speaking, if you have small areas, like for example, Mount Pleasant, Michigan here, right? If I didn't include this inset map, we'll talk about inset maps in a second, right? But if all you had was this, you would have no idea which way was north. So if you if if you cannot count on the user being familiar with the area to orient it themselves, and third would be if a lot of the features may be misleading. If data features may be misleading. So what do I mean by if data features may be misleading? What I mean here is there will be times when you generate maps especially with man-made features, where the features look like they should go north-south, but they're tilted ever so slightly because they were put in maybe based on magnetic north instead of, quote, true north, or maybe they were put in along a different axis, but the user might see those straight lines and assume that they're supposed to run north-south, east-west, 90 degrees. That wouldn't be the case, right? So if you see features in your map that you think might make orientation misleading, include an north arrow. But you do not always need to have one. I also want to say too that there is a second way that you could do orientation. So orientation can be done either through a north arrow, but it can also be done with graticules. And we actually saw an example of graticules when we looked at that topo map. Actually, let me pull that up again just so we can take a quick peek. Give me one second. All right, so in this case, right, these orange lines right here, these are graticules, right? They follow lines of latitude and longitude. And these also give orientation because if you follow the lines, these lines should go from north to south and east to west. And it shows how they bend or curve or what direction they point is a good indication of orientation. So these orange lines are graticules. This here is a north arrow, right? They both achieve the same purpose of trying to show orientation, which is what direction is north and how am I moving north along a map? So the next thing that we often see on a map is going to be this bad boy right here. Which is going to be scale. So three, actually let's, let's number these. Two, three. Right, so three is going to be scale. So the role of scale is to give a relationship to give a relationship between distance or size on the map and distance and size in the real world. And so there are three ways that we can accomplish scale, and I've included two of them on this map. Um, the first is with a scale bar. Where you can measure along the scale bar. Compare that to the map. And so, for example, this distance measured along the map is equal to 1.5 miles in the real world. So it's a visual representation.
right? You can compare distance on the map to the scale bar, look at the units and numbers of the scale bar to figure out how much that is in the real world. All right, the second option you have is what's called a representative fraction. Not fraction, representative fraction. And with a representative fraction, right, these are typically the one colon colon x, where one is the unit in the real world and x is the unit. Actually, let's go ahead and write that down, right? Unit. In the real world. And x is the unit on the map. Right. So for example, in our case, right, we have a 1 to 45,000. Right. And so with the representative fraction, what you do is you measure some distance on the map with a ruler. Right. And then you can use algebra to figure out how far that is in the real world. So if we wanted to read this representative fraction in sort of plain English, right, it would be one unit on the map is equal to 45,000 units in the real world. Oh, I'm sorry, I just realized I made a typo here. This should be in the real world. Flip these, right, in the real world, this should be unit on the map. I apologize, I flipped those. So it's one unit on the map is equal to 45,000 units in the real world. All right, so if you pulled out a ruler on this map and you measured, say, one inch, the distance between this railroad and this major road here, you measure that and it was one inch, what you would say is that one inch measured on the map is 45,000 inches in the real world. So there's a little bit of algebra that has to go into making this work um, and also making sure that you keep track of your units because you don't want to measure it on the map in inches and then report it at, in feet for example that could be a problem um, but what makes the representative fraction nice is that unlike the scale bar there's no unit associated with this so it works in any unit that you want to measure on the map you can then report out in the real world without having to do Right, because the, the scale bar has specific units associated with it. The representative fraction does not. The third way that we can report scale is going to be through, and we didn't actually put this one on the map, is what's called verbal. Ooh, let's make that a little bit. It's what's called verbal scale. So with verbal scale, what you do is you actually state the scale in words, not verb, we call it verbal, but it's written, right? So it's similar to the representative fraction, except instead of it being unitless and with numbers and a colon, you actually write it out. So for example, we could say something like one inch is equal to 75 miles right so there's pros and cons to all three of these the verbal scale is nice because it's plain english anybody can or most people can read it and kind of understand what it means the representative fraction is nice because it's unitless so whatever you measure on the map with whether it's metric or imperial you can get that same unit out on the other end and then do a little bit of algebra to figure out what you want. It's pretty straightforward. It's nice. The scale bar is nice because it's visual, right? You don't have to read anything aside from maybe a couple of small numbers in the units to get a really good sense of what the scale of the map is. Now, I'm going to make an important note of this. It's going to be in orange, okay? So what the important note I want to make is 
with representative fractions in verbal scale. The reason we don't see them too often is these are broken. if the map changes size. Right, so what do I mean by the map changing size? I'm gonna show you, right? So if I scroll up a little bit and I just simply zoom in, boom, the map changed size, right? This scale right here, this one to 45,000, no longer true. And in fact, it wasn't true when I put the video together. Right, because I changed the size of the map to put this video together and I changed it again right now. However, this scale bar has been accurate the entire time. Because it's visual, right, the length of this bar changes as you change the size of the map. So this relationship of this distance measured on the map being 1.5 miles will be true no matter how many times I change the size of the map. This representative fraction scale was only true at the size of the map that I made when I originally published it. And the same would be true for a verbal scale. Zoom out again. And the same would be true for a verbal scale, right? Verbal scale and representative fractions, although they're easy to read and useful for not having to deal with units, don't work as soon as you change the size of the map. So if you hand the map to somebody and they download it and immediately change the size, you've broken your scale, right? If you publish it to the web and somebody goes to the website and changes the zoom on their browser window, scale is broken, right? That's why most of the time you're going to see a scale bar because that's the one that is the most reliable in terms of being redundant and, and protected against interference from the user. So hopefully that makes sense. The fact that we have scale being the relationship between the size and distance on the map and the size and distance in the real world and the three different ways that we can represent scale. I think we're actually going to break this video into two parts. We're going to stop here and we'll continue with more of the elements, map elements in the next video. So as always, if you have any questions, please reach out. Thank you.